Welcome to chapter 16. We're still talking about the sun, which we did in detail in chapter 15, and now we're treating it as an example star that we can then use to compare to other types of stars, which we'll introduce in chapter 17. Now, the very first section of this chapter is kind of short, and all it really tries to do is to lay out a reminder that science is not about just a warehouse of knowledge, but about putting forth ideas that we then test and either disprove or elevate to theories. So chapter 16 actually um, starts, section 16.1 starts with two incorrect ideas for what powered the sun that people used to believe, scientists used to believe, until we were able to make some observations to test these ideas. So the first idea was that comets or meteorites falling into the sun were able to give it enough mass to burn, just like a massive coal furnace that was just using simple combustion. It was something that people could at least process as something familiar to them from the everyday world around them. We had coal furnaces, and so we could say, hey, those are very hot and bright. The sun is very hot and bright. That seems reasonable to us. However, that first idea can be tested by figuring out how much mass would have to be added to the sun each year and figure out whether that would change the force of gravity. And it would. It would be a measurable difference in the force of gravity. And since we didn't see that difference, idea one can't be the correct way that the sun is powered. So we throw that idea out. The second idea is gravitational contraction. In physics, if we have an object that we compress down into something smaller, it tends to heat up. Because when it is large, when all of the mass is more separated from each other, it has a lot of gravitational potential energy. And when the mass is concentrated, it's closer together, it has less gravitational potential energy. So what if the sun is just turning that gravitational potential energy into light and heat, the kind of energy that we can actually utilize here on Earth? This is not an unreasonable idea when we consider that the sun, before it really got started, what we call the proto-sun that we'll be talking about in chapter 20 or 21, the proto-sun did use this process as it was forming what we now call our sun. And uh, an aside kind of fun fact, Jupiter is actually currently undergoing gravitational contraction. And so Jupiter produces more heat, uh, infrared radiation, than it receives from the sun. And so this is something that scientists and physicists knew was a possibility. The problem is, is if we if we think through all of the calculations outside the scope of our particular course, but not unreasonable for scientists to do, it tells us that the sun is only um, a couple tens of thousands of years. And as we will talk about when we get to radioactive dating in chapter seven, the sun is actually billions of years old. And so idea two could also be ruled out, could be proven false. So although these ideas are wrong, it does show us that no matter what we try to come up with, we need something to be the original type of energy. In idea one, it's a bunch of mass that we're gonna burn. In idea two, it's gravitational potential energy. An initial type of energy that we just turn into heat and light. This concept of energy not being created or destroyed, just changed, is called the conservation of energy, and it is something we have to keep in mind as we go through this chapter. Now, when we turn to the next section of the book, uh, section 16.2, we come across Albert Einstein's probably most famous equation, not necessarily his most important work um, or contribution to science, but the thing that is in the public conscious the most E equals mc squared. We may have heard this before without really understanding what it is. E stands for energy. M stands for mass. And the letter C is the same speed of light letter C that we learned about in chapter 5. It has a number value, and really it is just a way so that we can fix the 
units between energy and mass. What this equation is telling us is that mass can be considered as an available source of energy when we consider the conservation of energy idea. Okay. The other thing to remind us of before we get further into this chapter is that in chapter five, we reminded ourselves of the structure of the atom, something we would have been presented with in maybe high school chemistry, but may have forgotten. And so we reminded ourselves that an atom contains protons with a positive charge, neutrons with no charge at all, and electrons with a negative charge. Those are three very common particles in the world around us. We are made up of those particles. It is important though to be aware that those are not the only types of particles that exist. Every particle has an antiparticle. If you've ever heard, especially in science fiction, Star Trek, things like that, antimatter, that is a real thing that exists. Antimatter is the general word for all of these different antiparticles. So for example, an electron is something that our atoms contain, but the anti-electron has a name, it's called the positron, although I suppose we could call it the anti-electron the whole time. And that's true for all of these other um, antiparticles. Additionally, beyond matter versus antimatter, it was discovered that there are additional particles beyond just the three standard ones we just mentioned. So in the 1930s, there were a bunch of experiments involving nuclear reactions to figure out how atoms work, to figure out how nuclear processes work. And in some of them, it seemed like there was more energy at the beginning than at the end, and so energy wasn't being conserved. This is a problem. So to explain it, Wolfgang Pauli kind of invented this idea of a massless particle so the mass is zero, but unlike light, photons also have no mass, but unlike light, didn't really interact with anything. He called it a neutrino. Neutrino stands for little neutral one because it has no charge at all and is very, very small or low mass or zero mass. We now know that neutrinos aren't perfectly massless, but that's not really an essential significant detail for our particular course. The reason I introduce these two is because they are going to show up when we talk about how the sun powers itself, and I want us to make sure at least we have a sense of what these things are, even if we don't understand them in detail. We are not taking a particle physics course. You do not need to know the inner workings of these things. We just want to recognize these when they come up. So, the probably most important single slide of this entire video is this one that distinguishes the two types of nuclear reactions. Fusion is when small things come together to form a large thing. When small mass um, nuclei, so when we say the word nuclei, we mean the things in atoms that aren't the electrons. When they come together to make a larger object, we call this fusion. In chapter 15, we talked about the fact that the sun is mostly hydrogen and helium. If you have ever looked at a periodic table, these are the two smallest possible elements that we can make. And so fusion would be the obvious choice and the correct choice for what stars actually use. They are pretty much entirely composed of small mass nuclei. And so fusion is really the only thing available to them. Fission, on the other hand, is when a large thing breaks up into two smaller things. And nuclear reactors here on Earth, they do go through a nuclear reaction called fission and not fusion. One thing that may help you, and if it doesn't, then don't worry about it. One thing that may help you is that fusion has one S because it has one final thing. Fission has two S's because it has two or more final things that it turns into. You can look at A and B pictures here to maybe help make that distinction. If you need to pause the video to make sure you have these written descriptions um, in your notes, that's perfectly fine. All right. So the key thing is that the big reason, reason that we can't use nuclear fusion here on Earth is because fusion requires 
extremely high temperatures, over 10 million degrees Kelvin. In the core of the sun, that's not a problem for us. We have very high temperatures and very high densities. That allows us to have these hydrogen nuclei, which are pretty much just a proton, be able to come together at high enough speeds that they stick together. That's what fusion really needs for us. On Earth, we have been able to do fusion only in very small amounts in a lab and putting in a whole lot of energy to get that tiny area to be able to undergo fusion. It is not a valid source of energy generation for us here on Earth. Now, for the sun, the particular process that the sun goes through is called the proton-proton chain. We do need to be able to recognize that term when it shows up, especially because in the next module after this one, when we talk about chapters 22 and 23 in OpenStax Astronomy, we will be talking about the fact that to low mass stars like the sun use the proton-proton chain, but higher mass stars actually use a different type of fusion. So we wanna be able to tell the difference. We do not need to memorize the steps I'm about to show you. The inner workings of the proton-proton chain, I'm gonna show you once, we don't have to recreate it, but it is worth being able to understand where the outcome happens, how it actually happens. Because this one, two, three step process, the most important thing to recognize is that the sun is not like following a recipe and actively trying to power itself. Instead, it is just a whole bunch of stuff that just constantly is hitting each other. And because the sun is three quarters hydrogen, 75% hydrogen, the most common thing that will hit each other is two hydrogen nuclei. And so step one is that process. This happens constantly in the sun's core. Two hydrogen nuclei collide at extremely high speeds and they fuse together. Now that's two protons. We would have expected if we're just taking like two pieces of Play-Doh and sticking them together, we would have expected two protons stuck together. <laughs> but that's actually very unstable. What happens instead is one of those protons gets converted into a neutron and we end up with hydrogen two. Hydrogen two is a um, isotope of hydrogen. We learned that term very briefly in chapter five. It is a version of hydrogen. And because we changed from two positive charges to one, we also have to make a positron. And to make sure that the energy is balanced before and after, we also make a neutrino. So in step one, we create neutrinos and positrons. We introduced those terms in this video so that we recognize what they are. We're gonna set that aside for the moment. If you have ever played any of the phone games that are like alchemy um, type games where you just take two things and put them together, like earth and water or air and air and see what happens, sometimes you get to make something new and sometimes nothing exciting happens, nothing new happens. If we imagine the sun's core as one of these little games, the most common thing that can happen is two hydrogen things hit each other. That will continue to happen, and every single time, step one will occur. We will just make a whole bunch of this hydrogen two called deuterium. Now, if that hydrogen that has two things, the hydrogen two, if it manages to find another hydrogen one, another proton, they will slam together, and we will actually get what we might expect. The hydrogen two, the deuterium, has a proton and a neutron, the proton all by itself, hydrogen one, has just one proton as shown in the picture. And if we slam them together, then we have two protons and one neutron. That's what we get. And to balance the energy out, because we need energy conservation, we actually produce a very high energy photon. Gamma rays are the highest energy photon we can make, and we make one of them. And then finally, step three happens because every single combination we try with the hydrogen two hitting the helium three or the hydrogen one hitting a helium three, any of those things, none of them make anything stable until we are able to get 
two of these helium-3 nuclei together, when they hit each other, they will form a helium-4 nucleus, that's two protons, two neutrons, but there are extra protons that kind of fall off in this process, and that's what step three is showing us. So as a reminder, because I said it before we got to this slide, and if we're starting to feel overwhelmed in this slide, I need us to understand we do not need to memorize these steps. I am showing them to us so that we understand why we're going to start talking about neutrinos and positrons, but we do not need to memorize these inner workings. A single picture that shows all of this in one is shown here on this slide. And the most important thing to recognize is that in that top layer of the picture, four hydrogens are going into this process. But in the second layer of the picture, we have to add two additional hydrogen ones here. So there's really six that go into it. But in that last step, two come back out. And in the end, the overall change that we have made is to take four protons that were all by themselves, four hydrogen ones, and turn them into a single helium-4, a nucleus that has two protons and two neutrons. And in the process, we have created a bunch of energy. Energy in the form of gamma rays and neutrinos and positrons. This energy is coming from the fact that the four separate hydrogen that we put into it actually has more mass than the helium nucleus that comes out. And so the mass difference becomes energy through E equals mc squared. Now, to resist the pull of its own gravity, the sun has to push out by creating so much energy that it's able to create a pressure. The sun has to convert 4 million tons of material into energy every single second that we're talking and listening in this video. Now, let's make sure we understand these byproducts before we end this particular video, because it's worth making sure we have a sense of what's going on in the sun. The gamma rays are a form of light. They are going to start to leave the core of the sun, and they are light the way that we want the sun to be lit up, but they'll start to hit everything, and we'll be talking about them again in the next video. They'll slowly lose energy through a whole bunch of different interactions, so that eventually when they get to the surface, there's a lot of visible light and ultraviolet, and they're not all extremely high energy gamma rays. The positrons, we called those antimatter. That's important. A positron, as soon as it finds an electron, and there's a bunch just flying around free, they will hit each other, they will annihilate and create new gamma rays, which will then go through what we just said. They'll go through and interact with the atoms, but eventually leave the sun as the light that we hope that the sun creates for us. And then there are neutrinos. In that first step that we talked about of the proton-proton chain, we make neutrinos. Those are really interesting because they tend not to interact with almost anything. So the fact that we're able to detect them at all is something that's very interesting and took quite a um, lot of innovative thinking to be able to figure out. And we will think about them much more in the next video. So this video was here to help us um, introduce ourselves to the fusion method that the sun uses while not getting too much all at once. You can stop this video once it's over, which is about now, and um, take a break if you need to. And when we come back, we'll talk about the other things we understand about the sun's interior and how we understand them. So I will see you in that next video for chapter 16.